In the news this week, ex-Labour Senator Fatima Payman's secret meeting with Muslim community leaders revealed. Exclusive footage coming up, plus Peter Candy's analysis. Almost 24% rise in service fees. A single-income pensioner's battle against the rise in costs at her retirement home. CrowdStrike triggers a global outage on Microsoft Windows devices across the world, resulting in widespread chaos and later Dr Andrew Miller's comment. This is The Evening News with Ivan Loon and Maliva Thorne. Good evening. We begin with a story you won't see anywhere else. Exclusive footage have emerged of what appears to be ex-Labour Senator Fatima Payman attending a confidential meeting with Muslim community leaders at a prestigious hotel in Perth this week. This development comes after Senator Payman crossed the floor in Palestine and quit Labour. Paige Reid with this exclusive report. There are some interesting movements happening in regards to former Labour Senator Fatima Payman after a breakaway from the Labour Party several weeks ago. Exclusive footage obtained by WAMN News shows on Tuesday night between 6.30 and 8.30 p.m. what looks to be Senator Payman having a private meeting with what look to be several influential Muslim community leaders, some of which have medical backgrounds. Take a look. This comes several weeks after Senator Payman stepped down as a member of the Labour Party after crossing the floor on the Palestine issue. Following this, we also exclusively revealed that senior sources within Labour suggest the party may increase scrutiny on religious loyalty over party and national interest after Payman's breakaway. WAMN has reached out to both Senator Payman and the other communities possibly present for confirmation. Paige Reid, WAMN News. Senator Payman's confidential meeting with Muslim community leaders at a Perth hotel this week may imply that faith-based groups will be her key support base for the future. So what's next for the breakaway ex-Labor politician? Here is Peter Kennedy's exclusive take. Senator Payman was elected to the Senate courtesy of her position on the Labor Party's Senate ticket. Now that she's an independent, uh, she doesn't have that uh, support from the Labor Party uh, and if she wants to be re-elected, she needs to have broad-based support across Western Australia. So her job now is to consult widely and to build up her support base. Uh, nothing wrong with that and nothing wrong with meet, meeting with, uh, with Muslim groups or other faith-based groups. However, uh, if uh, her aim is to rely solely on faith-based groups uh, to uh, seek re-election in four years' time as an independent, uh, that could be a problem. It could be uh, relying on sectional interests for re-election and that would be a new first in Australian politics. Uh, Faith-based parties have not uh, done well uh, in Australian politics uh, and uh, the uh, aim would be for Senator Payment, obviously, to maximise uh, the support that she has in that area, uh, certainly based on the uh, Israel-Gaza conflict, uh, but uh, she needs to be upfront. Who she consults with, uh, nothing secret, be upfront and uh, let West Australian voters know exactly what the score is. Uh, if she uh, is upfront and open about those issues, no problem in her seeking re-election in four years' time. Then it will be up to WA voters to decide whether she gets another six-year term in the Senate. Peter Kennedy, WA MN News. Hi there. Are you looking for a new home or want to refinance your car mortgage to get a better rate? At AA Finance Solutions, we have the expertise and knowledge to help you to find the right loan for your needs and budgets. Contact us today. Let us help you to make your home ownership dream a reality. AA Finance Solutions, your local mortgage broker. A global technology outage has hit Microsoft systems, causing significant impact among major businesses in a variety of sectors. Services such as Bendigo Bank, CBA and NAB Bank, supermarkets and even telecommunications companies like Telstra have been hit by the outage. With several major news companies also in the dark, many laptops that are Microsoft unexpectedly restarted all over in Australia on Friday afternoon. 
Sky News and even the ABC were impacted by the outage, with the technical problems resulting Sky News Australia going off air. The cyber outage was due to the system's third-party security system, CloudStrike. The outage has also created severe problems overseas, with the cloud service problems resulting in cancellations and grounding of aeroplane flights across the United States of America. In a statement on social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, CrowdStrike stated that the issue has been identified, isolated, and a fix has been deployed. Perth's public transport network is poised for significant enhancements with a series of technology and infrastructure upgrades that will eventually see train services running every three minutes. The 10-year $1.6 billion HCS project aims to replace and upgrade the signalling and train control systems across Perth's rail network, allowing more trains to run more frequently and ultimately increasing capacity by 40%. It will include signal upgrades across the whole train network, 7,000 new transponders, new train cab signal equipment, and new passenger information displays. It will also create 230 direct jobs and support another 750 jobs. Police air wing officers recently had a light surprise when they were patrolling around Rockingham. At around 12.30 in the morning on Wednesday, a laser light hit the police helicopter. The laser light was tracked by officers in the helicopter to a Wombers residence backyard. Police from Rockingham went to the home and searched it, finding a laser light. A man aged 44 years old was arrested. The man faced summons due to the use of a laser light as he caused fear or alarm with laser or light to people in conveyance or others. While he will face court, the date is not known. A spokesman from WA Police stated that aiming a laser light at planes and helicopters is highly dangerous as it has the ability to blind a pilot. Offenders risks $10,000 fine. Offenders risks a $10,000 fine if found guilty in court. Perth is preparing for a very furry weekend with the Cats WA Cat Extravaganza. The event will take place on the 27th and 28th of July at Curtin Stadium, Bentley, and will run from 9am to 4pm on both days. The Cat Show will also have food stalls, a cat-themed market, opportunities to talk to breeders, and feature the renowned international cat judge, Stephen Meserve. In total, 114 cats are entered in the competition. 25 stalls will be at the event, as well as food trucks and face painting, and the location is near the freeway. Parking is also free on the weekend at the stadium. Uh, well, we have 112, 114 cats entered, so yes, it is going to be quite competitive. Um, the public will actually see two styles of judging, because on the Saturday, Stephen will be judging in just long hair, short hair, um, whereas on the Sunday it'll be according to a group, so there'll be three different groups plus companions on the Sunday. And now here's Austin Pollock with what's coming up on 6 News tonight. Thank you guys. The top stories we're following on 6 News. Systems are returning worldwide following a major tech outage, sending airports, hospitals, supermarkets and even media companies into complete chaos. Also making news today, Israeli's jets strike Houthi targets across Yemen. And Joe Biden expected to drop out of the race for the White House as pressure mounts from Democrats. Join us on the hour, every hour, 24-7, live on 6 News, on our YouTube channel or our website, 6newsau.com. For now, guys, it's back to you. Thanks, Austin. Now, speaking of the Cat Festival, it's certainly going to be an exciting weekend at the Curtain Exhibition. Now, Ivan, speaking of cats, what's your favourite? My favourite is Bengal. I love the colours, particularly like the brown ones. And uh, if you mix the brown dots with the black fur, it looks very, very nice. I really like mm. the way that it walks. Very graceful. Mm. What about yours? Um, I like the Maine Coons. I think that they're really fluffy. They look like um, big, fluffy, um, small dogs because they're so big. How big, how big are they? Uh, they can grow like to probably about that size, I would say, would be uh, an average Maine Coon. And they can be like even bigger. Imagine, I've seen photos. Imagine that playing with your dog. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think I'd get on pretty well. No. <laughs> and to tell you what, Paige is a cat lover and she joins Western Perspective with a different story. But hey, Paige, good evening. Thanks Ivan and Melly. Welcome to Western Perspective. I'm Paige Reed.
a single income elderly pensioner is facing a whopping 24% increase in fees at a retirement village in Willoughby. 83-year-old Erin signed her life lease for a one-bedroom unit 21 years ago. Her family claims her service fees were less than those of other residents living in two or three bedroom units. After receiving a letter announcing the increase, Erin's daughters are supporting her fight following unsuccessful consolation attempts at the Department of Commerce as management refuses to reduce the amount. Erin's daughter Carlos joins us this week to reveal the stress her mother is going through and what's next for the family. Mum's lived at Warunga Village since 2003. Um, she's always paid, all her fees have always been um, for a one-bedroom unit. And people and couples that live in two- and three-bedroom units have paid more than mum. She's a single pensioner in a one-bedroom unit. This year, Altera Living have equalised the fees. So now a single elderly pensioner, my mum's 83, has to pay the same as couples in two- and three-bedroom units for the service fees. And then the percentage you also pay in MRF, which is like a sinking fund, um, that goes up as well because her fees have gone up so much. So overall, um, we calculated her increase is 23.6, we say 24%. On mm. the figures we were originally given by Altera. What kind of stress has this experience placed your mother in? Mum being elderly, she's 83, um, stress easily impacts her health and it has. Um, my sister and myself have been documenting her decline in health over the stress. She's also got the um, retirement villagers saying that they might redevelop and she'll, she might have to be moved forcibly. Um, they're not allowed to do that under current legislation, but um, the CEO has said that um, the government, she may or may not be asked to relocate during the term of a tenancy. There are pending legislative reforms currently with the government to address this matter. So she was already under stress with being told that, and then she's had her fees whacked up, you know, 23, 24%. Um, yeah, she's very upset about it and is very difficult for elderly people to, you know, fight these sort of matters as they would when they were younger. Mm. Hence why my sister and I have been trying to assist mum as much as possible. So what exactly is going on at the moment then? What are the steps that have been taken? We first went into dispute with the village and when you do that, you're supposed to swap documents and say this is our argument and they're mm. supposed to give us the documents, what their argument is. We haven't got any of them. Mm. Um, they're required to give us the documents. We haven't got any. So that fell over. Um at a meeting on the 5th of June, the CEO said that the Board of Management wanted Erin to go to the Department of Commerce for mediation. So we made an application with Mum yeah. to go to the Department of Commerce Consumer Affairs to mediate it. Um, they suggested, the department suggested conciliation because there was such a large divide between us, between the parties. Um, we said, yeah, fine, we'll conciliate. Mm -hmm. um, Altera Living said, yeah, we'll conciliate. Their conciliation position is we're not moving. She's paying that money. Um, they also told the department that a billing error has occurred in the past. Um, it's a lot more than that. If Altera's position is correct and we are wrong, um, they've mismanaged for a quarter of a century, 25 years. Mum's lease date is 1st of January, 99. Mm. So all residents that had leases of that era, it's been mismanaged that long. So it either we're right or our chair is right. But mm. if our chair is right, they've been mismanaging for a quarter of a century. Where we are now, conciliation has fallen over because they're not moving. Um, so that's why I'm discussing this with you. Obviously, the department needs to investigate and audit this village and how it's been managed and find out who's right in this argument because how can we go anywhere when they're not providing the documents to us? The department has the power to make them hand over the documents. So they've, they've put out incorrect figures in their budget papers to all the residents. Um, the CEO said she had reviewed all the leases at some time ago. And it's it's amazing that she did that 
but she still put out letters breaching the lease, telling the residents they'll now pay on the 1st and the 15th of the month instead of the fortnightly that my mum has always paid that lines up with her pension payments. So we fixed that part. That's, that's the only part we've managed to fix. They've reissued a letter, um, so she's now been requested to pay the money fortnightly. She's staying on her current payments that she paid last year because the operating budget has not changed. So while we're in dispute, mum's paying the same amount because the operating budget hasn't changed. Why should she pay more until this is resolved? But it's very stressful. The longer this goes on, it's very stressful for people in the 80s. Over half the people in the village are over 80. What exactly happens next? Well, we wait. Um, the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, mm. you know, have to look at this as far as we're concerned. But in the meantime, we, we want the message out there to people to be very wary of, um, you know, pe people in their 80s don't want to have these sort of arguments. They want to live in peace. They don't want to be threatened with redevelopment and live in construction zones. Um, now, mum can't be moved according to her, you know, legal agreements. But like we say, the CEO's told her um, that she may have to. She may be empowered by new legislation to move her. So we, we have a large issue with that and we'll fight that as a separate issue if, we, if needed. But, you know, the government needs to look at this, you know, the government needs to have a very good look at this. If they do move her, okay. would there be um, alternative accommodation provided? There's there's nothing in Mum's contract or disclosures about her being moved, so we'd ha we'd have to find that out. In 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 retirement villages with people with um you know that have signed up in the last five years, I don't doubt there's something in there that says you know if we redevelop, this is how we'd go about it. But mm. there's nothing in Mum's that says that. And she's 83. She's modified her unit to suit, you know, her her mobility status. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to have to do all that again. Mm -hmm. um, we think that they're, they're renting out 20 units out of the 85 at the moment. Um, they need to look to a different area to redevelop, not where people have done life leases. Life leases have, are not worth the paper they're written on if they can do this to someone. I'm just saying with this increase, mm. this is a huge eye-opener to, to me. I live in Queensland, so it's it's stressful for me and my sister. My sister works full-time as a teacher. Mm. You know, we're trying to support mum in every way through this. Mm. But just the fact that it, a huge increase that's been imposed on mum like this, mm. if you can't see an increase of that magnitude, would be deeply upsetting and highly stressful for elderly people. Mm. You've got no business in the retirement industry, period. And now here is Dr. Andrew Miller with his weekly medical and news commentary. Oh, thanks for your time. One of the things that I'm really interested in healthcare is who takes responsibility? Who takes responsibility for ensuring that there are professional standards and for uh, ensuring that if anything does go wrong, uh, that the systems are rectified so that it doesn't occur again. Now, the other day we saw global enterprise and travel brought to its knees when the CloudStrike software, which is part of the Windows security system, caused the Microsoft screen of death to appear uh, where we don't want to see it, including inside healthcare institutions that run electronic medical records. Now, when a doctor makes a mistake, quite rightly, we perform a close investigation to figure out uh, what went wrong, partly with an eye to um, being able to give people an explanation as to what happened for them, and also uh, to learn from it so that it doesn't happen again. Nobody really gets to choose these days when it comes to technology. Technology moves ahead under its own steam and the companies that bring it to us uh, make an awful lot of money out of uh, introducing these tools um, that will be adopted because essentially uh, that's the way humans work. We take on the latest thing and as we move into artificial intelligence, this is all going to accelerate because the tools used to develop new software will become uh, in some senses automated so that things will start happening quicker and quicker. What we need to do is make sure that our leaders hold the companies responsible, make sure that they can't wriggle out so that if we have artificial intelligence assisting within healthcare and in other spaces as well, but my interest particularly in healthcare in making diagnostic uh, assistance decisions, in making decisions about patients, 
uh, we have to know who's going to be responsible then because it shouldn't be the doctor and the patient who are left holding the can uh, when there is an issue with what's been recommended, for example, by artificial intelligence. We still need to be able to fall back on um, the old-fashioned ways of doing things so that if electronic medical records are not available, we need reliable systems in place in critical care applications. And so that will include things like being able to write stuff down with pen and paper and have that included in the record somewhere. So whilst I'm all for uh, technological improvement, very keen adopter of uh, anything that's available uh, that can assist us to do things better and do things more efficiently so we can get better bang for the healthcare dollar, I also want to see these companies that make big amounts of money out of all of this held responsible. We don't have a good track record on that. If we look at social media at the moment, we know that there's a lot of um, money being made through advertising on those, but there's not a lot of responsibility being taken for some of the content on there which just should not be on there. So to equip ourselves better for the future, we need leaders who are going to be prepared to stand up to these companies, all of them, and put in place really good, strong regulation uh, and controls and systems to make sure uh, that they are as responsible as all of the humans um, who are in healthcare dealing with patients every day. Thanks very much for your time. That's Dr. Miller, and that was Western Perspective for this week. We'll be back again in a few weeks' time, but for now, it's back to you. Thanks, Paige. And that's our weekly news and current affairs. We have the latest news on our website, wamnnews.com.au. Remember to subscribe to the WAMN Extra News Club so we can continue our work in the community. Full details on wamnnews.com.au forward slash news forward slash extra. From Mally Page, Peter and myself, wish you good health, good night. Next week, our Sunday bulletin will be on a seasonal break, so we'll be back on the week after instead. Until then, have a great evening. Thanks for watching.